Hi there everybody, Zane here with Sailing Views. Today I have Ryan Finn. Now I've known Ryan for a good while and he is a very, very interesting character. One hell of a sailor and you're about to find out a little bit about what he's been doing and some of the things he has done. How you doing, Ryan? Good, man. How you doing? I'm all right. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, let's start right. off with how you learned to sail and when you got started. Um, I learned to sail. I learned to sail cruising with my parents, and this was um, in the '80s. Along a lot of stuff on the Gulf Coast, a lot of stuff in the Mississippi Sound, especially. And um, they had a Cape Dory 28, and then they had a Cape Dory 36. And you know those boats are really great light air boats. So we did a lot of motoring around the Mississippi Sound. Yeah, and this is also they were new to it. They were new to it at the time, and so um, so we did a lot of navigating by keel. You know, just a lot of running aground, bouncing and, the bottom, and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And this before GPS, it was just like them bickering about what a channel marker meant, and and you know, me and my brother and sister just down below, like playing with all this stuff we weren't supposed to be touching. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, now, who all influenced you in sailing? Who, uh, you know, taught you a lot? I mean, a lot of it came from sailing. Never, I never really took off with me until like uh, in, in high school. You know, I, I sailed a lot with my parents before that. And I liked being on boats and stuff, but the boats that we were on, you know, the, they were just these cruising boats and they were just, they weren't, they didn't get my imagination going at all. And then in high school, like freshman year of high school, my dad was like, hey, there's this Wavelength 24 for sale <laughs> in Fairhope. And he's like, and, I'm, and it's cheap and I'm gonna get it. And so he got that and um, we did a little delivery, uh, bringing the boat back to Slidell. And I was like, oh, all right, this is a sailboat. <laughs> you can, you know, then you start getting a feel for it. And like, you know, I, we sailed the hell out of that boat. Just, yeah, just, you started learning what a, a boat feels like instead of the big, yeah, you know, of, 1980 pigs you've been growing up on. Yeah, instead of what the ground feels like when you're on a boat, you know, <laughs> right? So, a seawall, but yeah. um, but the wavelength was great, and um, my brother and I really took that and just and we used it a lot. Oh, I get you. Well, you still didn't tell me who gave you, who else influenced you, or who influenced you. So far, it's just boats. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's basically, that's basically it. I, you know, I sailed with, I've seen my brother was, my brother and I sort of took that ball and ran a lot. And my dad, actually, that's when, that's when he and I really started having a good relationship was, was when we got that, that little boat. Yeah. So he, he and I sailed together a lot at that point. And, um, you know, we do like, we do a lot of the, we started racing them and, um, doing like a lot of the races that aren't even around anymore like uh summer series and biloxi all these great old series that were just a lot of fun we learned a ton and um you know and all of a sudden it was just we were learning with everybody you know everybody we were learning the you know, steven and karen cho you yeah. know they had the same boat and we you know they, a lot of people were influential so i got you all right now i know that you do a ton of offshore racing and a lot of long distance deliveries and just, just deliver, yeah yeah you love the offshore stuff um right. what's the name of your program that you're running now uh two oceans one rock okay and tell us a little bit about that that's um that's basically it's the the project is a single-handed record from new york non-stop to san francisco around cape horn yeah and um I think that I came up with the pro I came up with the the boat first and then the project or after you know, but I was like, what's available? You know, I I've done a lot of sailing in France and and, and um, you know, I've, I've been around a lot of cool boats and cool teams and sailed the minis over there a little bit in class forty stuff and uh, <clears throat> you know, it was just like became really clear that if you want to play over there, you got to have a you got to have a lot of money. A lot, and it's, <laughs> and it's so much of it was like, dude, the mini class was ridiculous. Like the mini class was like, this this kid would show up, 
with a fully funded program and a brand new 250,000 euro bow. <clears throat> and me, I'm like, I built my mask and stuff. And like, he'd show up, I'd be like, what's his, and then somebody like, what's his background? And he'd be like, oh, well, he, um, his dad went to college with the, with the guy who owns that company and he was a really good ski instructor. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and they were like, Oh, you know, I was thinking about doing the mini. He's like, Oh, I'll sponsor you. And then they bought him coaching and all this stuff. And then that's how a lot of that stuff over there is like a lot of who, you know, a lot of the names, you know, now are from, if they didn't have the money, they, they, they knew somebody who did and they, the sponsorships tricked up and they obviously put their time in and, and got to where they are. But, um, yeah. Not a lot of them just sort of came from the streets, you know, so. But um, so I looking at that, I was like, I didn't like being in France that much, you know. It was in, was my favorite place in the world. <clears throat> and um, and I was like, I'm definitely not going to move over here to do this. So like, what can I do? And so I was like, well, what's a cheap thing that goes? I want to, the other thing to say on the mini is you'll learn really quickly that you that you miss sailing boats that go upwind because those things they do they do this and they yeah. do it slowly you know i mean it's just this wedge of cheese that you're dragging through at this funny angle and the keel's pointing to leeward and they're terrible they're great downwind but it's like you know you know how it is on a on like a melodious regatta where you know the downwind legs are over like that yeah and the upwind legs take forever and then you're like what did we do all day oh, we sailed up most of the day you know <laughs> Yeah, so it's like that's how the mini felt. I'm like, I've, all I remember is sailing the boat upwind. <laughs> so I was like, I wanted a boat that went upwind and downwind quickly in a proportionate kind of way. And so that's how I came up. And I, and, a, and I thought a proa was a cool boat. You know, I was like, they're weird, and that's all great. But I was like, structurally, if I'm going to go small, I want something that's not going to fall apart in the ocean. And look, forget it. I don't care if it's Sea Card Thirty. C card 30 is going to be faster than a than a 30 foot proa, but I know which one would make it across the ocean quicker, you know. It, the C card 30 would be upside down somewhere in the Mid Atlantic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they're they're just a lot more dangerous. See the proas, so, they all seem home built, homemade, and that would scare me a little. Yeah, but dude, the the guy who built my proa, he, he built you know he built the daggerboard cases for the big Oracle trimaran, mm -hmm. you know. The boat itself, if I built it, it would be I'd be scared. I'd be I'd be shit scared. Yeah. I'd be scared. I'd be like, I don't trust it, I'm not going anywhere. But like this thing is like a cello. I mean it's like it's 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 heavy it's 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 built strong where it has to be and it's light everywhere else, you know? It's yeah. like he he did that super well. Yeah. Russell Brown. He's a brilliant. There you go. So. All right, so you're attempting to go from New York to San Francisco. Uh what is that record? It's never been done single-handed, so I could do it in the Cape Door 36 if I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a great idea. Okay, um, but I wanted to. I wanted to. Do, I one of the one of the goals of the project is to is to do a lot with a little, a small boat, 3,200 pound boat, small sails, and just do it do it quicker than a class 40 could ever do it. You yeah. know, and like you know, class 40 is an expensive boat compared to this by a lot. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just a proof of concept kind of thing. And, and it's exciting. It's an exciting boat to sail, you know. It's, um, there are a lot of challenges with a, a small boat in the ocean is violent. You know, if you're going, if you're averaging 13 knots in the ocean, it's like basically driving a, a Boston whaler full throttle in the ocean. You know, it's yeah. just like, yeah. it's a tough rock. You know, you're flying in the air a lot and stuff. You know, I have to Velcro everything down in the, in the entire cabin. Yeah, I can throttle back. I can go eight, nine knots, but you know, the boat wants to do that. Yeah, the boat wants more. It wants more. Yeah, the boat doesn't. The boat doesn't care if I'm on it or not. It's like <laughs> it's just. Yeah. So. Now, how? Uh, speaking of that, you know, the, the what kind of uh, how prepared are you for you know falling off or do you have any you know what's your safety like on that? Um, I mean. Basically, I'm trying to go on the four decks as little as possible, right? That's the deal. Um, yeah. You know, which is fine, which will be good for coming, you know, leaving New York, 
and and basically down to you know down to the to the towards the equator you're just you're slicing across the trade winds the whole time it's gonna be it's gonna be poor tack for that the first quarter of, of, the, of the record you know yeah um the second half is gonna be a lot more complicated getting 2k porn you know maybe not you know maybe not down towards the bottom part of brazil but once you're past once you're down by uruguay and stuff it's mm-hmm. it gets really complicated and cold it gets and strong. um yeah i mean that whole thing that whole part is just going to be like a grin and bear kind of thing i'm just going to try to make the ride to that point as comfortable as possible getting around cape horn is just going to be about getting getting off the coast of chile and as north as as you know as north as possible so yeah um but what's the question falling off the boat yeah well yeah i mean i mean it's just like don't fall off stay on the boat <laughs> yeah well i mean you're gonna have autopilots going so i mean is there a remote control where you can hit spin up or something before yeah, I'm gonna, you're I'm gonna, too far away? Yeah, I've got I've got an NKE pilot. I'm going to be using. I'm going to get the the neck remote um, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean that way, um, if you, yeah, you fall off by the time you hit up, you know, your head pops above yeah, water. Yeah. At least you can spin the boat into the wind or something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, there's there's that, but I mean, I'm I'm extremely deliberate when I move around any boat. Yeah. Honestly, like I never I never look at where I'm going and start walking you know i'm always like i'm always monkey bar i'm grabbing onto one thing every every step i take i already know what i'm going to be holding on to before I yeah. make that, you know, all right so do you have any funding for this trip or are you, are you looking for funding or what are you how, i don't, how have, are you gonna I do don't have any i don't have any funding you know i have been i've been i've been feeding this project by just basically doing deliveries mm-hmm. and spending money where i need to um Right now, that's a little slow. So I'm gonna. I'm. I wanted to avoid looking for funding because it just gives you all a lot more freedom to not. You know, it's a pain when you get a sponsor. You have to do stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've got to be. You have to be to some extent. I'm not sure how much of me I'm allowed to be. Yeah. I've never had. I've never had a big sponsor. So I. You know, but I've worked with teams that do, and I was always like, every time I do it, I do that. I'm like. I wouldn't change my position with them, with the skipper, you know, like yeah. so much like showing up and, and Hey, you your photo ready. And then you, they come back into the huddle and are just wiped out, you know? Yeah. But, um, so I'd be, I'd be nice not to have to do that, but I, I think ultimately I'm going to have to. Yeah. I'm slowly, I don't have a big work list of things. I don't have like, this is what I need to do the entire project. I have, this is what I need to get this done this month, you know? Yeah. And then I then I have a new work list. So Yeah. Well I know you just did uh what was it, like a three or four day trip across the Gulf of Mexico just a couple of days ago just testing out your Dodger. Um Right. Yeah, you know, so obviously the boat's pretty well dialed in and I know you did a the race of carts from Pensacola to Mexico and I mean so the boats can do it and it's it's oh, yeah. It's pretty ready. Uh what what kind of things are you waiting for now? I mean, look, redundancy stuff, you know, like yeah. I need another, I need, I need at least one more autopilot ramp. Um, you know, it's a lot of backup stuff, really. Honestly, that's it, you know, and, and I'm just trying to see what do I need that you can never figure out what you're going to need as backup. You know, you'll never get it. Yeah. Hey, you got a cat too. Yeah, mine uh, right over there ready to jump on me from the, the shelf. <laughs> that's, um, that's that's our cat Tucci. But um, <laughs> you know, you so you never can anticipate what you're going to need. So I don't. I try not to bring everything, you know. And sometimes you're like, oh, you didn't bring enough. And I'm like, well, no matter what I bring, it's not going to be the right thing, you know. Yeah. It's just based on all my experience. I know I need this type of this much of this type of glue. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just basic backup stuff. Two multi tools. Yeah. So, what's the uh, longest trip you've made so far? Um, solo. Yeah. The long I was I sailed I sailed Jazeera from from Marina del Rey to Panama, and then I brought from Panama back up to here. And uh... all right, sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> we uh, had an internet drop during our video, so we're going to pick it up again with this question: What was the longest trip you've been on? And you were telling us about uh, 
some sort of 50 footer go back in on that so i i, I brought the i brought the open 50 over to to uh, to england with kip stone um and this guy greg feldman and we brought the boat over there and then it was going to go to the to la Havre for the start of the tjv katrina hit i flew back to newport got my truck all my gear drove to indiana watched cable news talking about katrina for two weeks and i was like i'm going to new orleans and we're not supposed to go but i'm like just i can't i can't sit here all day and so on the way down to new orleans this guy called me and was like hey do you want to be a co-skipper for the tjv kip stone recommended you and my guy dropped out and so i went to atlanta parked my car at a friend's house flew to portugal did the tjv on this old death trap of an aluminum open 50. it was insane <laughs> so crazy like people when we got to when we got to brazil the race committee came up to this they're like oh we're so glad to see you we didn't think you were going to finish yeah they were totally like, before expecting... we started yeah. i was like then why'd you let us start <laughs> we barely passed the inspections so i was like i can't believe they let us do that so then i didn't get back to new orleans until december but the longest trip was that was the tjv that was 4500 miles yeah that's pretty wild all right, so with the open 40s, or I guess Classic. the open 30s, open 40s, I don't know. You know, the Olympics are picking up some sort of, you know, double-handed offshore boat. Uh, do, have you had, had any thoughts on that? Or Not even, really. Even considering it? No? I've never considered it. I mean, I mean, dude, it's the Olympics. You know, you do the Olympics, you, you got to you gotta get them. I'd have to raise way more money than I'm trying to raise right now to do that. By a lot, you know, that would be a really expensive campaign. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, an Olympic campaign just consists of sailing a lot and, you know, really just sailing a lot. And you've already got that experience. Really, all, all you have to do is have a boat that you can get dialed in that last year. Right. You know, and you can relatively be, yeah, be close. Who's paying, who's paying for it? I don't right. know. That's the thing. That's Hopefully we can, we can get a sponsor. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're not talking about a four seventy, you know. Yeah. Well, so I mean, I want to do this first. This would be, if I if if I'm able to do New York San Francisco on a on a goddamn proa in a in a respectable time, then then I'll uh, then I'll maybe consider something else like that, you know. But I, I wouldn't. This is way cooler than that. Too, yeah. You know? For me, it is. As for a delivery skipper who likes to go quick, who likes being stressed out all the time and trying to be mellow at the same time, you know, like the game, the game is what I'm really involved in, the offshore game, the long distance weather routing game. I love it. That's why I like doing, I like doing these deliveries, man. It's, I don't sail any differently on a delivery than I do in a race. And that's why now when I do a race, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Here, yep, we're going here, and we get there, and I'm like, the whole thing is how we played the game with the weather. I don't worry about the other competitors. You know? see, see, I've sailed with you before, and uh, a couple, you know, several times, and uh, I don't know. I don't remember you being that just eh, hey, whatever. <laughs> I remember you yelling at me a couple times uh, down when we were doing the Salvo Thirty Three Regatta. So yeah, but I'm not like that anymore. I'm just right now. I don't care. Any, I don't care about the race results. I'm gonna shit. Honestly, <laughs> swear to God. I'm like, if we win, great. And if we didn't win, I'm more interested in what happened with the strategy, you know, than I am the actual like going home and like, you know. Yeah, you don't care about the pickle dish. I understand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So, what's uh one of the most interesting things you have seen floating around? So I know you've been everywhere, so. Oh man, I've seen, recently I did a delivery off, you know, off the coast of Cape Canaveral. I saw a life raft that was empty huh. and went around that, took pictures, reported to the Coast Guard. And it was in English, it was from England. Wow. Um, the first time I ever sailed single-handed was on this little this little boat, um, a little 21-foot Beneteau. I was crossing the Gulf of Mexico and I saw, the, you know, and I wasn't good at sleeping at that point at all. Like, I, that's something I'm really good at now is getting rest. You know, like, boom, I, I close my eyes, get a little nap here. So I'm never exhausted. When I first started sailing single-handed, 
you don't know how to sleep. You know, you just keep, you go, go, go until you crash. And I, the first time I woke up, I was way in the bow behind all these sails and stuff. I was like, what am I doing? You know, <laughs> all the way in the bow. Yeah. And, um, but so this time I woke up and there's this huge uh, raft, huge, like 20 by 30 foot raft of blue and white balls staggered. Huh. All right. And it was surfing and I was reaching and it was a surfing across the bow. And I, I was like, should I follow that thing? What is that? This is off. This is outside of Pensacola. And um, so I didn't know what the hell that was, but it was, it was weird. And then I talked, I was at dinner with this guy who worked for Lockheed and he's like, Oh, that was a missile target that it broke off. <laughs> Cause he yeah, was asking like, okay, all these don't questions. follow that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, Hey, what's that? <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that was pretty cool. All right. So what's one of the best trips you've uh, been on? I think like my, my favorite deliveries, like the best deliveries I've ever been on were <clears throat> between Tampa Bay and the Mississippi South. Yeah. I've had I've had the most great just twelve knots of wind, flat water, beam reach. You know, like a deli- like when you're sailing offshore and you're able to point at where you're going the entire yeah. time. That never happens. Yeah. You know? You're always pointing at where you're going on the last day. You know. You know, I've uh I've done that trip basically from, you know, New Orleans to Key West or something like that numerous times and I've been lucky where I've caught that perfect angle, you know, that loose jib reach kind of semi, you know, the perfect jib fetch. Dude, I've been nice. lucky and caught that a good bit. So Yeah, like it, you can you could put like you could put a, a you could put your cup on the deck and just leave it there. Yeah. And you walk around and trim sail, you know, it's great. Yeah. So those are my favorite deliveries. I don't like I don't like waves. Yeah. Shit like that, you know? I just deal with them. Well, I've had have had those trips where it's on the nose and you're getting yeah, beat yeah. to death. But uh, yeah, 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 those aren't fun. Anybody who says they like that, no. they just I don't know how many miles they have, but they, they don't have enough. No. <laughs> no. All right, uh, let's talk about uh, the America's Cup. You know, with all this really cool technology, what are your thoughts on it? I think it's great. I think it's I think it's insane. Um, when I first saw the models of the boats, the, the computer models, I was like, oh, great, more vaporware. But I was like, but it's the America's Cup. They must know this works. I was like, it looks like it would look like going like 300 miles an hour on a unicycle. It just didn't yeah. look like it would work, you know? And then when I saw the first prototypes of Bill sailing, it, it, lo- it still looks like a computer model when they're sailing. <laughs> like, it just looks fake. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It, I mean, um, yeah, they look amazing to me. I don't know. I mean, I'd be scared to be on one, but I would love to go on one just for a couple zips around the bay and then be like, okay, <laughs> just <laughs> out, out of my realm. realm, take it back. Right. <laughs> no, I, I, I would never, I would never have any ambition to do it, but um, I think it's pretty cool. I like the whole foiling thing because, like I said, I don't like waves that much. Yeah. So, like, you know, I get it. You get up above the waves, you know, but um. I wouldn't want to learn on a moth or anything. I think like that the UFO would be a cool platform to just like not get super into it, but just go out for day sales, you know? Yeah. That'd be fun. But I think, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been a huge advocate of the America's Cup um, foiling thing, you know, from the start, I just thought it was crazy. It was insane when they were 72 feet long and doing it. Couldn't believe it. Yeah. I was like, I was like, we're never like, this is like the, you know, back in the turn of the century, giant America's Cup boats, you know? Yeah, like the old J-boats. All over. Yeah, the huge J-boats. Those things are still glory monsters, you know? They're mm-hmm. just amazing. I don't care if they weren't as fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, so let me fall back into some of these questions. Uh, what's your favorite type of boat and why? Um... I don't know. I don't think I, don't think I have a favorite type of boat. I really like all boats. I like I like going four knots. I like going thirty knots. You know, I like the way some boats go upwind. You know, we had that. I had I was part of that that quarter tonner girl for a long time. Yeah, the boat's stupid as hell, but it, it went upwind beautifully. You know. Yeah. And it went downwind like a, it was a nightmare. Yeah. But um. Yeah, I mean, 
I think my favorite boats that I've that I've sailed off, like probably the ones that left the biggest impressions on me, were like the the Owen Clark Open Fifty Art Forms. Mm -hmm. was, I have a lot of miles in that boat. I loved that boat. That was a great. It was a yacht, you know. A lot of the like a lot of the French boats would be like um, they're just a machine to get the guy to the race through the race, you know. But like mm -hmm. this was like a McConaughey built Open Fifty, and like they sanded the inside of the ballast tank. You know what I mean? Hmm. Like, there's no. It was like everything's perfect. Yeah, that boat was great. And um, also, I what totally screwed me up is when I sailed. I brought the Waterworld Trimaran back from Hawaii um, to California, and that thing was awesome. And it was an old sixty, but it just was still like, dude, we we were doing like twenty two knots and twelve knots of wind, that steady. You know? Yeah. So got to do that. I got it. But. All right, so no real favorite then. Um, well, let's get into a couple other little questions. Uh, women sailing, what do you think? I mean, can we do more? What should we do? I think it's, yeah, I think, um, you know, you know, Isabella Tissier? Yeah. You know she is? Well, I know the she name, was always, I think I know her. She, she was like a, she was a soul, like one of the French single-handed mm -hmm. rock stars from like the 90s. She was, she was a badass. But she had a whole thing where, and I totally agree, like when I read this in the 90s, I, I've never let go of this idea where she's like, um, you know, because they were, they, were they were put together like a Volvo campaign with an all woman's boat, right? And she's like, well, this is stupid. So like, why are we doing that? She's like, we should be mixed. It should always be mixed. Every boat should have a mixture of, you know, should be mixed crew. That's how you, that's how you get things done. You know, that's how you learn. You get the, learn other people's strengths and weaknesses and that kind of thing and um i think i still i still think that way i don't i think that like i don't think that there should be just women's or just men's sailing teams i think what they're doing with the volvo now is is, is perfect you know have yeah. women on the boat have yeah. men on the boat. so i think they're doing it right and i like what they're doing with the olympics with the double-handed that double-handed boat yeah mandatory it's got to be that way yeah. Yep. I agree. All right. Uh, where do you see the state of sailing? Where do you see it, you know, going? Is that you or me? That's me asking you. Oh, okay. No, the the, the dialing sound. Yeah, I don't hear anything. All right. But I've got headphones on. I don't know. You're in New Orleans, man. It's got to be you. All right. Um, <laughs> I don't. I think the state of sailing is kind of screwed up, honestly. You know, like the truth is, the truth is that I wish that we were. I wish we had that. I wish we had like a strong middle class type of sailing, like they have in France, and like we had in the '70s and '80s, where people had jobs and they were still able to do the SORC and all that stuff. I think that my generation, the generation after me, they're not going to have. Look, you know how it is. You go to a yacht club and start hanging out with all these. All these boomers, and they're t they're telling all their they're telling all these SRC SRC stories. You know, we I got nothing like that. You know, yeah. that's that shit is amazing, and and, and that, that regatta that that type of regatta that type of racing I think was incredible. But I never did it. The closest I got was like Key West, and then that shut down pretty quickly after I, that started. For me, you know, that's sort of why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Yeah, because I'm like. Well, I have control over my destiny in this regard. I can't, you know, rely on the sailing scene to get its shit together, you know. But I think without, you know, we have, and we have this this divide where it's basically you're sailing dinghies or you're sailing, you know, Transpac 52s and these 100 footers. And that's very, all 100% professional, you know, like the, I think the Corinthian spirit's been smashed is, is not a part of it, you know. Yeah. You know, as far as the Corinthian versus pros, you know, we do that. Uh, there, there's divisions in, in a lot of the boats I sail in. And, you yeah. know, a lot of your top Corinthian teams can be right there with the pros, but generally the pros still always win because, I mean, let's face it, they're all, you know, you've got. The pros, they do this. Yeah, they're that's full they tilt pro. Yeah. Full time. Yeah, that's all they do. No. They're pretty damn good at it. So, yeah. um, I don't I know. I mean, think about, like, think about for me, like, a big inspiration, like my favorite sailors, 
you know, there there are a handful. Of the, there's a handful of the French guys who who are, are still sailing now, but um, you know, like Mike Birch, Mike Birch, you know, with the O Star with the Route de Rome. Like when I love that set, that '60s, '70s, early '80s version of the O of the single-handed sailing scene because there were people were sponsored, but they did they were just getting to the starting line. You know what I mean? It, yeah. it wasn't a big deal, and you'd have like a 235 foot sailboat sponsored by Club Med, and then <laughs> Mike Birch. Mike yeah. Birch would finish behind him in a 32 foot trimaran. <laughs> and then I'd find out later that it was just, it was literally a delivery. Yeah. He, he was literally bringing the boat to some customer in America. <laughs> you know, like that I think is a great story. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely planning on getting you in here and just letting you go on sailing stories. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely uh like you say I'm, I'm gonna break off from doing the interviews here soon still do the interviews but i'm going to start up a whole new segment where just sailing stories you know sit yeah. around tell a story see what it no, is no look that's i mean that's what that's what i want to hear yeah you know <laughs> i got you all right uh would well, you have any ideas on what we could do to grow this sport and get more people into it yeah i think um I, I do. I think that like, okay, New Orleans, they have the New Orleans Sailing Center, right? Mm -hmm. You know what kind of, guess what the most popular sailing is in New Orleans? You already know. Yeah. Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights. A lot of people started, look, when, 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 I, when, I, when, I, when I owned Girl, we had, we had crew that would just come and go. You know, mm -hmm. people would be like, hey, I'm looking for crew. And I always need to wait on the boat because it's, it's, it's about to flip over at the dock. Mm -hmm. and, and so we take people and like I can think of three people offhand who the first time they ever sailed was on that boat and they now own sailboats. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's when within the last four years. So I was like, that worked. This whole this whole introducing them to sailing through 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 uh, Wednesday nights worked great. And they clearly learned enough to feel competent enough to get their own boats. And um you know, I think that I think that that's a good way to get people into sailing. So they have like this this uh, sailing center in New Orleans, and I'm sure they're going to teach kids how to do match racing and all that kind of shit. But I'm like, that's not what the sport needs right now. Is that yeah. we don't need like an elite discipline. Yeah, we need more grassroots out there. You know? Yeah. And, and I think you could teach kids how to how to cheat in PHRF. Mm -hmm. You know how to get cheater boats in PHRF, win Wednesday night events. You know, and and not even really be good lure lure sales, but be good Wednesday night sales. And then if they want to take it further, they can. You know, <laughs> that's what I mean. Yeah, but you shouldn't start them at the like the most competitive part. You know? <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. All right. Um, so, what are your future plans? What's coming up next for you? More C. Charles, more C. Charles on Jazero. So I, I, I built the main that worked. I've got some tweaks for that. The Dodger I need to finish. It's, it looks so stupid, but you know, it's, it works. And it really, honestly, the Dodger changed. It entirely changed the game for me with that. <clears throat> you know, like it made it so much more comfortable. Like I've never had the hatch open on that boat in over twelve knots of wind, and yeah. I was had it open at twenty five knots. Okay, I was like, "That's that's a big deal for me," because um, that boat is that boat is it, it's violent, man. <laughs> so, so th that's all I'm doing until the start of until I start the record, which is going to be this winter, this upcoming winter. Um, that's it. I'm just going to be testing stuff, breaking stuff, testing it, testing it, testing. It. That's it. Yeah. And then hopefully, uh, hopefully the the New York San Francisco thing will be the easy part you know? yeah well I tell you what that whole whole trip sounds amazing and uh sounds like it's gonna be a brutal painful trip I hope your body's ready for it <laughs> yeah well you know that's something else I've been doing is, is my girlfriend and my girlfriend always exercises in the morning so I've started doing that with her yeah you need to do something <laughs> you know because yeah. that's and, a lot of miles and a lot of that that's pounded into a lot of walls so it's so yeah it's 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 really bad man I mean I've caught on that boat, I've caught can I've caught a whole, whole thing of beans cooking off the pot in the air by the handle, like it just so flying through the air. And I was like, and I was like, 
this I, I cannot cook on this boat anymore. So it's all freeze dried or like powdered food and like and everything has to be velcroed down. Everything. Hmm. I can't think of one thing that shouldn't be velcroed down on that boat. Wow. And like I should be velcroed on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the chair. Yeah. All right. Oh Lord. All right. Uh do you have any advice for new sailors? You know, they're getting into the sport. Yeah, okay. I do I do. If you want to get into sailing, if you see people racing and you're like, I want to be part of that, learn how to do bow. <laughs> That's learn how to do bow and learn it well and you can get on any boat you want because there aren't a lot of good bow people just walking around the docks anymore. Anyway. Yeah. So, you know, that can do dip pole and you know j- jiving symmetrical kites and that and you know it's just there aren't a lot of people that have that discipline anymore back in the day they were everywhere yeah it's not so much anymore so like if you want to get into racing learn how to do bow on big boats and then you know if you want to get out of that and i don't honestly know how you get out of being a bow (laughs) (laughs) once you're bow you're stuck (laughs) then you buy a boat (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) didn't you get pegged as a bowman for a little while yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. then you buy something then you get in the back of the boat and you, and you yell at the guy at the front. But, yep. but if you and you, but if you just want to start sailing, I I honestly think I think Wednesday nights are the best. I think they're the most fun, easiest sort of. You learn a lot. You learn about a lot about handling boats around other boats, and but it's not you know it's not like a full on stress fest. And if it is a stress fest, then you're on the wrong boat. Get on another boat because there are a lot of boats that are just out there for to have fun. You know. Yep. So. All right. Uh, well, with that, I'm going to cut Ryan off and say I will bring him back again for some more stories. Um, but thank you, Ryan. That was great you, and very informative. I love hearing uh, all about Jazero and your trip. And I'm definitely going to try to get you on before you make your trip. And if you ever need anything, you know where I'm at. Oh, I mean, so, I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, everybody, this is Zane with uh, Sailing Views. Like, subscribe. Hit all those little buttons. We will talk to you later. Uh, For Ryan Finn, uh, Two Oceans, One Rock, here he is. Bye-bye. Thank you.